John 10 was baptized right here. And 22 years later, the ashes from his cremated body lay in rest during his funeral service, right here. My two children actually grew up in St. James. They attended preschool, they attended Sunday school, Bible school, acolytes, they sang in the choir, youth group. But being part of a church family does not protect anyone from heroin. So the question is asked, nature or nurture? By nature, Tim was born a happy baby. He was smart, he was handsome, he was strong. And by nurturing, he came from a stable two-parent home. We tried to live by example to teach our children to grow up to be loving and kind and caring for other people. We held long-term steady jobs. We came from large extended families. But even with all that, still no magic shield against heroin. So how did my son Tim end up a heroin addict? The truth is that no place is safe and no one is safe. Whether you live in a small town or a big city, if the child's parent is a single parent or two, whether the parents are highly educated or from, have a high school education, whether you're well off or you live paycheck to paycheck, whether you send your kids to private school or public school, whether they're in the honor society or a dropout, Heroin takes all prisoners. Heroin is everywhere. It's highly addictive, not only to a person's body, but also to their brain and to their soul. Because what a heroin addict thinks about as he's shooting up is his next fix. My son's death certificate lists cause of death as heroin toxicity, that is, poison by that which he could not give up, because Tim hated being an addict. How do I know that? Because he kept journals that we found after he died. There were letters that he wrote and did not mail to friends where he outlined his addiction. At one point he wrote, I, did, I lied to you about heroin, Mom, because I didn't want you to think I was some drug-using monster who put poison into his veins. So Tim hated heroin, but at his first opportunity, he would use. We also cannot believe that rehab is a good answer to the heroin epidemic. There are no standard metrics of success. It's everything from a two-week outpatient to a six-month inpatient, with varying results. They're hard to find. Some rehab places will take you only if you're clean. Clean for three months, clean for six months. Others will take you only if you're using. Most are filled to capacity, and the dropout rate for heroin is phenomenally high. I did send my son to rehab. And when I went to visit him that spring, I was surprised by the change in him. He was more like my original child. And this is a card I wrote to him that he kept. <clears throat> my dear Tim, how good and wonderful it is to see in your voice, and to hear in your voice and see in your face the real Tim. I have missed that person desperately. And at times I was so afraid you were gone forever. But here you are, strong, capable, courteous, smart, kind, gentle, funny, witty, deeply spiritual, too. I love you, my son. I am proud of what you have accomplished in this last month. Stay strong and focused by living one day at a time. You have every chance for a clean and happy life. God is there with you. All my love, Mom. A year later, Tim was found dead in his bed in his own room in our home. Because once a heroin addict, always an addict. Even if you stay clean, you are always an addict. Another friend's son had struggled with heroin for several years, but he'd been clean for six months, and the very next day, he was scheduled to go to rehab in Pennsylvania. 
It had taken his mother three and a half months to find him a bed, but he was ready to go. The next morning they found him dead of a heroin overdose that had been cut with rat poison. The police tried to assure the parents by saying, sometimes this happens when addicts want to celebrate. They think, well, I'll have one last fix. And that was his last one fix. Heroin is hurting us all. Whether or not it's in your family, it destroys families. An addict will lie and steal and commit unspeakable violence against the people he or she loves. Heroin will take over the fabric of your daily life. There is guilt and shame and a pervasive sense of helplessness. And what about the functioning addicts, addicts those who do hold jobs and are still using? Well, one of the symptoms of a heroin addict is nodding off. That is, they can be wide awake one moment and the next they're sleeping. How about driving a car at 60 miles an hour and falling asleep? You may become the victim of a heroin addict's theft and violence because they need that money to buy the drugs. And something that nobody talks about much is the future generations. Every 25 minutes in America, a baby is born dependent on opioids. Every 25 minutes, a baby is born a heroin addict. It's not a pretty sight, but I challenge everybody in this congregation to go home and look on YouTube and find a video of the babies that are born heroin addicts. Their bodies are spastic, don't know what to do with their muscles. <clears throat> They're crying in this pitiful, unnatural cry. They're sick. They can't breathe right. Many times they don't want to eat. The problem is so bad that some hospitals actually have specialized units to care for babies born as addicts. That is a sad statement for our country. We don't yet know the impact that these children will have as they grow older, the impact on our lives, these innocent victims. Well, what can we do to save our children? Gee, if I knew the answer, I'd said it a long time ago. But one mom's advice is to educate yourself about what drugs are and what the symptoms and the signs are that your child or someone, it doesn't have to be a child, is using. You know, I belong to a group, we call it Mamas, Mothers Against the Misuse and Abuse of Substances. And to belong to that club, you have to have lost a child to drugs or alcohol. It's not a very popular club, but we give each other some peace. Because one thing we always say is, I was the mom. I should have been able to save her. I was the mom. I should have known what was going on. But like my parents and like your parents, we do the best with what we know at the time, don't we? And I didn't know what a heroin addict looked like or sounded like or acted like. So educate yourselves. Then stay close and stay involved. They won't like it because we all remember being teenagers. You know, that sense of independence, we don't want mom and dad hovering over us anymore. Join groups that talk about the problem and work on ways to overcome it. And talk out loud about it. As Father Ben said, it's time to shine the light on this. It's no longer somebody else's problem. And talk out loud with your children. Don't think you're going to protect them or shelter them from this because the, the likelihood is that every 15-year-old in Warrington knows somebody who's died of a heroin overdose. And when I, said, when I speak to the youth groups about my son's life, don't keep them home because you don't want them to get upset or cry. You should be worrying if they're not upset and not crying. My friend's son, Zane, died of a drug related to heroin. He was 19 and went to a party, and on top of his prescribed medicine for depression, he smoked PCP and used methadone. The next morning, his mother found him dead at the wheel of his car, parked at a school.
In closing, we will not beat heroin if every family affected has to fight it on its own. We need to admit that it's here, if not in your own home, but maybe next door or down the street or in your child's school. Join St. James in its efforts to raise awareness and somehow take action working with other community members. And I will, I will close with asking you to not bear judgment against families where this happens. And as, as we always did, to love the child and hate the addiction. Thank you. Thank you. It takes tremendous courage to, to share that story. And when I talked last week and we were going to talk about it, I, I can't tell you how grateful I was that, that, that Norma stepped up and, and shared her story. Because statistics uh, only do so much, uh, but knowing uh, how deeply it penetrates a family and a community uh, is something greater than that. But here are a few statistics. And I think part of the reason why we are behind on this is that it has escalated at such an alarming rate. Uh, when I was 25 years old, uh, you were twice as likely to die from a car accident uh, than drug addiction, and that has flipped. Uh, that has flipped, now you're twice as likely uh, to die from a drug addiction than a car accident. Uh, and then when I was uh, 25, it was uh, twice as likely, if you did die from a drug addiction, to be cocaine. Heroin, something that grips you as much as that does, uh, was, was not as pervasive as it is now. Uh, and so it, it requires a different attendance, uh, and we have to change how we respond. Uh, when I was 30 years old, you were five times more likely uh, to die from a homicide from a handgun than you were uh, from a drug overdose, and now for the first time, uh, drug deaths supersede a handgun uh, homicide. And so it has uh, escalated at an alarming rate uh, and, uh, and it's not just a heroin. Uh, opioids uh, are distributed three times more than they were when I was 25. Uh, in Kentucky, the, the birthplace of my two children, uh, there are 100, and they were in 2014, there were 128 prescriptions uh, for opioids for every 100 people. 120, there's 12 states that have more prescriptions for opioids uh, than people living in that state. And that's, uh, and that's an issue that we have to address. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I remember from my middle school uh, uh, health class was my PE teacher, my health teacher, saying uh, that you know, when somebody asked him about trying cocaine, uh, he said, you know, the uh, best case scenario is I hate it. Uh, you know, and so he never tried it because he was worried that, the, uh, that yes, he might like it. Uh, and what that would mean, and that had uh, nowhere near the power to grab hold uh, of them, as addictive as that is, uh, as, as, as heroin is. Uh, but it made me wonder, and I tried to find out what possesses people to try it for the first time, knowing uh, that the rest of your life might be sucked into that. And the reasons are as many as there are people. Uh, and they, as, as Norman says, they come from all different socioeconomic uh, strata. They come from... Uh, People with, uh, with, 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 with great mental health and people with poor mental health. One uh, was just an unfortunate night where, uh, where, where they had a bad breakup with, and, and you know, in the emotions of, of the breakup uh, and the susceptibility of it, uh, tried it for the first time and that was it. Uh, another was just uh, out at a college party and, 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 and carrying on more than they should and uh, their uh, they were more susceptible because of the, uh, the, the course of the evening, uh, and somebody convinced them that uh, it, while it was addictive, it wasn't as addictive as people made it out to be, and he felt like Superman at that age in his life. And uh, another one uh, was living with somebody with addiction and, uh, and tried everything to get him to quit and figured uh, if he saw her and what it looked like uh, and tried it for the first time just for that. Uh, but there were more ways that people tried it for the first time. Some uh, were, uh, were first dealing with their pain. Uh, 
uh, pain management and then uh, uh, increased their dosage and then couldn't get more prescriptions or couldn't afford and then found a cheaper way to, uh, to take care of it. And then with some, uh, you know, whether it's the uh, just taking more than what was prescribed or grinding it up for a quicker reaction. Uh, but the ways that people uh, ended up in the, 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 the same situation are uh, as many as there are people, and which makes it hard for us to combat. Uh, but it's an important part of realizing that there is no one template. Uh, it, it, it's not a mental illness. It's not a, a, a difficult childhood. It's, it, you know, it's not despondency. It's, it's as many things as there are people. And, uh, and so uh, taking the shame out of it, shining the light on it. Uh, and one of the other realities, as much as I am infinitely concerned about this for our, our younger uh, uh, people, uh, especially as a parent of two younger people, uh, the number of deaths for people 14 to 25 is less than they are for my age or for 10 years above. Uh, and when you, when you add in opioids, uh, up until 65. So it's not just the young people's disease. Uh, so many people, uh, as they deal with pain uh, and figuring out how to, uh, to deal with it and then become addicted through that way. So it's something that strikes all age groups. And I think there's uh, so much shame around it that we, uh, we often don't get the help we need or we often feel like that we can uh, let other people know what we're going through. So at the very least, I hope uh, this helps us at least step out into the light, helps us uh, be able to identify it, encourages us to be advocates for uh, making sure that Fauquier County has the, the resources. We are, uh, despite being sheltered in some ways, uh, we are above the national average in our, in, in our statistics uh, around, around heroin abuse and, and, and deaths. Um, so I encourage us to, uh, to together, collectively, and not just together at St. James, but with other clergy and, and other churches, uh, other community leaders, and other families, and other people affected by it, uh, brainstorm how do, we, um, how do we make a more active uh, in, impact in combating this.